Well, uh, I date the history of transhumanism back to an essay by Julian Huxley, where he penned the term transhumanism. His idea was a little bit more expansive than our contemporary idea of transhumanism. Uh, back in the 1950s, he was arguing that humanity should transcend itself, should consciously commit to transcending itself, both uh, biologically as well as socially. Transhumanism is an emergent philosophy analyzing or favoring the use of science and technology, especially neurotechnology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology, to overcome human limitations and improve the human condition. That it makes sense. The whole concept of augmentation really clearly makes sense to me, and I guess I, that kind of puts me in the middle of the, uh, of the transhumanist, extropian, um, cryonicist movement. Uh, many of us, are, of course, are kind of free-thinking libertarians. Uh, who believe the whole idea that um, you know we should take what nature has given us and move to the next level, as we clearly do. I mean, most of us, uh, if we our eyes are going bad, we don't just say, "Well, nature has given us bad eyes. Let's not do anything about it." We wear glasses. Or in my case, I had a radiokeratotomy, which is one of the better operations. You were talking about you know different ideas that, or crux points where you change your paradigm. Actually, I think getting my uh, eyes fixed with a, at the time, very cutting-edge operation 10 or, 10 or 15 years ago, a radio keratotomy, was a crux point for me, because I'd always had bad eyes, and um, all of a sudden, a single operation, literally, and it took about eight seconds, and my eye, I woke up the next day with perfect vision, actually better than perfect, uh, uh, better than perfect vision. In 1966, FM 2030 began to identify as transhuman, a shorthand for transitory human, people who were adopting technologies, lifestyles, and worldviews that were transitional to post-humanity. The only problem with transhumanism that I have is when they start talking about uploading your mind into a computer, I think that um, they usually oversimplify the problem of personal identity. They are not only too optimistic in thinking that the mind is just a pattern or some kind of uh, information processing uh, machine that can be just, you know, you can extract the software and the code and the data and upload it to a different media or to a different, you know, kind of machine and still be yourself. I think that doesn't work for two reasons. First, because of the identity problem, most likely that new creature you would be creating wouldn't be yourself anymore. You wouldn't have that sense of continuity. And second, they're, I think they don't understand what the human mind is. I think that it's a much more complex process. It's not only information processing. It has to do with some kind of experience that it is coded in our brain, but not in the same, same way as computer uh, codify information. The technological singularity, also referred to as just the singularity, is a predicted future event when technological progress and societal change accelerate due to the advent of superhuman intelligence, changing our environment beyond the ability of pre-singularity humans to comprehend or reliably predict. Uh, change is certainly accelerating. I mean, if I look at the big historical picture, there's no question that things are changing faster. A world that's going to be totally wired, a world with you know, deep sensors everywhere because they'll cost virtually nothing, a world that's capturing all of your experience and streaming it to these you know, indexable storage devices that allow you to call up those past experiences in ways your you know, biological memory can't do. Those are clearly coming. We can see the trend lines. Those aren't futures that are very disputable. What's disputable is how do we get the path we take down to that highly transparent society. Singularity seems to be the best option for handling that, or I'd be doing something else. I looked over all the possible ways that I could stop the dying. Artificial intelligence was the best, went into that. You know, I could start with the goals, look over your options, evaluate the options, pick the best one. You know, like don't try to rationalize it afterward. That's another one of the major rationality skills. Maybe even the major rationality skill. Intelligence to be useful must be used for something other than defeating itself. The development of superhuman artificial intelligence uh, could occur within the next uh, within the next 50 years. 
uh, perhaps as little as 20 years, uh, perhaps uh, longer than that. Um, so we should look forward to a lot of changes. When people think of the future, uh, they often think of robots and intelligent computers and so on. And there's a long history in science fiction and film and literature of these intelligent machines walking around. But that's really kind of a backward science fictional view. For the most part, there will be some autonomous robots, certainly. Um, there will be some stationary ones. I don't think many of them will be humanoid. We probably will have some because we're familiar with that. But it's not necessarily the best uh, physical form to take for most jobs. Most of them actually will be invisible. They'll be distributed. They'll be pervasive. They'll be ubiquitous. They'll be everywhere. And they'll be inside us too, they'll be part of us and we will be them. I don't think there'll be this rigid separation of AI and, and robots and human beings. I think more and more we will just interconnect, the, the, the boundary will be very permeable. We'll have little ro robots and nano machines inside us. We'll have supercomputers inside our brains and inside our bodies and our watch, watches and earrings and whatever else. And they'll be sensitive to other machines in the environment and we'll really be very interconnected. Ray Kurzweil predicts in his book, The Singularity is Near, When Humans Transcend Biology, that the advent of strong AI is the most important transformation this century will see. Indeed, it's comparable in importance to the advent of biology itself. It will mean that a creation of biology has finally mastered its own intelligence and discovered means to overcome its limitations. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I'm, I'm personally a big supporter, and I'm very excited about that. What we're talking about here is the, the singularity, uh, when machine intelligence becomes self-aware. And wow, I mean, what an amazing time to live in. Yeah, there, there are some uh, scary thoughts along that line, but uh, I, I think we'll adapt. Uh, we can incorporate that technology into ourselves. Uh, educational institutions will disappear once we incorporate that within ourselves. Uh, I know some people worry about coming back and having to re-educate themselves. I, I suspect before the end of the century, you'll be able to go into something like a 7-Eleven and pick up the, the latest half a dozen PhDs for $2 and you'll just, you'll install it. Um, now that doesn't mean we're going to be walking around like a bunch of tin can robots. Uh, we can look and feel just as uh, like we do now. Immortality is the concept of existing for a potentially infinite or indeterminate length of time. Technological immortality is the name given to the prospect for much longer lifespans made possible by scientific advances in a variety of fields. Nanotechnology, emergency room procedures, genetics, human physiology, engineering, regenerative medicine, and microbiology. You know, I, 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 do, I do use the word immortality, and I do use the word immortal, but I use it in a different sense, not to mean, not to mean invulnerability, obviously we can't be invulnerable, and not to mean living forever, because that's, that's not even meaningful really, uh, but simply to mean indefinite life extension, or in other words, the elimination of so-called natural death. Oh, certainly. I mean, when you think of immortality, you think of, uh, of God or or the angels or something like that. You, it has a very mythical sense to it. Uh, so when you talk about, well, let's try to achieve immortality for, the, for humans, uh, it can lead to erroneous interpretations. But in a certain sense, even the immortalists are playing the same sort of metaphorical, symbolic game. That is, most people who think tyrannics is cool don't sign up. Right? When it comes to taking a concrete action relevant for their lives, it's kind of like a, it's a disconnect, right? I had fun talking about this. It was exciting, but you know what? You know, my, but my life insurance forms? What? <laughs> you know, that, that's a whole disconnect. And in a certain sense, you know, fighting for immortality in general is, is well, as a, in a certain sense, it's kind of silly because nobody's fighting against it when it comes down to living one more day. What you're fighting for is this image of, of an attitude people should have about the long future. And that's just fighting in this image world of, of, of stories to tell and, 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 and you know, symbols. <laughs>